When Mike Judge set about creating a new animated sitcom set in the American South with realistic characters and themes, Fox wasn't entirely convinced. Judge had already established himself as a satirist with Beavis and Butthead on MTV, so Fox executives brought Simpsons writer Greg Daniels on board to help with the emotional aspect of character development. King of the Hill became an instant hit, striking all the right chords emotionally and comically challenging, compromising, and humanizing in the cultural conflict between conservative and liberal values. It's Judge's genuine lived experience of the South and its people, alongside Daniel's vivid portrayals of human emotional growth, that make the show live on as a favorite of millions even today. I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and these are the top 10 lessons that we learned from King of the Hill. But first, please subscribe and hit that notification bell so you get notifications whenever we upload. Number 1. Country music is some damn good music, I tell you what. Mike Judge started Tales from the Tour Bus in 2017 to share his love for country with a new generation. When it came to King of the Hill fans, however, his work was probably already done. Hank's distaste for anything but wholesome, God-fearing music exposed the show's audience to the joys of banjo plucking, washboard scraping, fiddle sawing bluegrass. In the episode The Bluegrass is Always Greener, the guys form a band with Connie, who shows an innate talent for playing country-style music on her violin, or rather, her fiddle. I didn't mean to get into it. The Dale Gribble bluegrass experience eventually collapses when Hank turns out to be no less pushy than Connie's own father. But dang it, even Con can't resist that catchy tune. It was on a moonlit night, the stars were shining bright. Number two. Being a parent isn't easy. Lots of shows tackle parenting. What makes King of the Hill different is that it delves deeper into a parent's paradoxical instincts. On one hand, they want to help their children develop. On the other, they hold a deep-rooted fear of being supplanted. Likewise, a child needs to coax out every bit of knowledge they can before usurping their primary role model. Although as a war veteran, Cotton hasn't had the easiest life himself, it's pretty clear that he's been a horrible father. Don't sass me, boy. You ain't too big for me to give you a lickin'. Hank knows this and is determined to do a better job of raising his own son. So when he catches Bobby smoking, Hank congratulates himself on forcing Bobby to finish an entire carton of cigarettes in order to stamp out the habit. Good job, son. <coughs> His plan goes horribly wrong when the whole family becomes addicted to that sweet, sweet nicotine. <sighs> Ugh, don't smoke, kids. In the end, it's their trailer park adoptee Luann who puts an end to their nicotine binge. Hank's vanity and pride blinded him to the fact that Bobby was never addicted to begin with. No! Number 3. Life's not always about winning. It's an old cliche to say it's the taking part that counts because we can't all be winners every time. Uh, something's wrong with my rifle. I can't shoot today. When Bobby develops a talent for shooting, it gives Hank a rare opportunity to take pride in his son for succeeding at something he can easily respect. However, once again, Hank's pride gets in the way when he remembers he's a hopeless shot. Threatened by showing himself up in the father-son fun shoot tournament, he tries to squash Bobby's passion rather than face up to his own fears. Eventually, Hank bites the bullet and joins up anyway. With a little help from a sports psychologist, Hank cobbles together a passable performance in the competition, but ultimately chokes in the tiebreaker. Miss. With all his fears being realized, Hank sinks his head in shame. Then, in one of the show's most heartwarming moments, Bobby becomes the immediate antidote to his disappointment. Overjoyed with their second place finish, the prodigal son charges towards the show's heroes, clutching his certificate with pride, and they agree to try again next year. Second place in a real father-son tournament. Can we do it again next year? <laughs> it's just, uh, it's a beautiful moment. Number four, victory is sweet. While winning isn't everything, it's a damn sight better than losing. Bobby's first love is short-lived, as he struggles to navigate the challenges of dating someone more mature and sophisticated. She's two grades above him at middle school. Nevertheless, the broken-hearted boy gets some breakup advice from Hank that puts him on the right course. Get it? Bobby's carnivorous display puts a steak in the heart of his plant-eating ex during a chance meeting. No, but 
Everybody's impressed. <laughs> Woo! Come on, kids. Slice the swap. snake eat machine. It really twists the knife. All right, all right, I'm stopping. Come on, Mom. Dad, we're leaving. Number five. Know your audience. Hank doesn't always approve of Bobby's theatrical aspirations, but even our propane-pushing protagonist can't help cracking a smile when Bobby starts telling jokes about the efficient, clean-burning gas. Great gas head. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> God help me, I love it. Bobby incorporates Hank's propane knowledge into his comedy and saves a grill sale, winning his father's genuine admiration. In fact, the episode Meet the Propaniacs might be the most we've ever seen Hank laugh. Oh, oh, that is funny. Things take a turn when Charlie Fortner, president of the Texas Association of Propane Dealers, takes a diaper joke personally on account of wearing one himself. A man in a diaper comes out on stage and ask me for a diaper! It shows how we can all enjoy comedy until the joke lands on ourselves. When the comedy troupe reunites to perform on a Sunday night at the Arlen Mall, the bemused shoppers stare blankly in confusion at the propane-centered material. But Hank's still laughing though, so way to go, Bobby. <laughs> Hydro! <laughs> Number six, kick some ass. If there's one thing that Hank never fails at, it's dispensing a well-deserved ass kicking. Take off that crown, I'm kicking your ass. Without really advocating violence, the show makes a pretty good case for doling out a beating when polite yet firm words don't cut it. When Hank meets his half-Japanese older brother who bears a striking resemblance to himself, there's just one ingredient missing. Junichiro Hill learns that despite his typical Japanese cultural reserve, sometimes it takes a little brawn to get your way. Uh, I kick your ass! Then again, we still wouldn't back him in a fight against his all-American kid brother. Number seven, put pride aside. Peggy Hill might be the most divisive character on the show. While she's a devoted wife and mother, her pride verging on arrogance has provoked some fans into suggesting she should have been killed off. Despite the haters, Peggy's not one to go down easily, just really fast and into the ground. At the start of season four, she survives an 8,000 foot drop when both her parachutes fail to deploy. This episode also gives us an opportunity to see the three time substitute Spanish teacher of the year in a more vulnerable light. Witnessing Peggy come to terms with her limited abilities while immobilized by a full body cast teaches us the essence of humility. Does it make Peggy more humble in the long run? Ah, uh, well, not exactly. In fact, in our Dark Theories video, we talk about how it might have actually given her narcissistic personality to disorder, but that's another story. Regardless, deep down, we know her heart's in the right place. Number eight, self-defense. With great power comes great responsibility. When school bully Chain Wasanasan starts picking on Bobby, Hank sends his son to learn self-defense at the YMCA. Although it seems like justice when Bobby uses his newly honed martial arts abilities to take revenge on Chain, the power soon goes to his head. I don't know you! <laughs> Who's next? Bobby's reign of terror culminates in a significant blow to his already thin chances of ever having a sibling. <laughs> The revelation that Peggy doesn't possess the same Achilles heel as his previous opponents ultimately brings the rampage to an end. That's not the only self-defense technique on the show either. Dale gets bonus points for announcing his pocket sand right before using it like it's some kind of Pokemon attack. Pocket sand. <laughs> Number nine. Be skeptical. In the age of Twitter, the political climate might be more polarized than ever. King of the Hill managed to satirize suburban life in the American South without malice or mockery. Many episodes revolve around Hank's conservative instinct to reject all kinds of hysteria. And he's often vindicated, at least in part, for doing so. When a member of the church starts a crusade against Halloween, calling it a celebration of evil, Hank takes a stand to defend the harmless tradition. Trick or treat! Trick or treat! Despite a seeming lack of support for the protest, Hank is eventually joined by a silent majority who resent the ban on festivities. The show has always been enjoyed across the social and political spectrum, with talks of a revival. Perhaps Mike Judge thinks Hank's no-nonsense attitude could be the perfect antidote to a world of extremes. And number 10, nobody's perfect. What makes King of the Hill's characters so likable is their flaws. Of course, it helps that they make us all laugh as well, but their humanizing flaws are what 
makes Arlen's residence so relatable. Although Peggy might have a perfect self-image, we recognize it's a front for some deep-rooted insecurities and questionable linguistic ability. Luann's good looks and, um, other talents don't protect her from her own emotional vulnerability and naivety. Bobby's a hopeless underdog, and Hank, while he may be the hero of the show, is constantly forced to navigate a world he increasingly struggles to understand. On the other side of the coin, even those we consider antagonists at times, like Khan, are softened by humor and humanized in the show. Khan cruelly teases his neighbors whenever they suffer any pain or embarrassment. However, he doesn't seem to have any real friends on his own and is always snubbed in his attempts to flatter Ted Wasanasong, his fellow Laotian and social superior. In season 13, he's revealed to suffer from manic depression, the final piece of evidence that his external arrogance hides a far more vulnerable side. Let me die. <laughs> And of course, my favorite character, Cotton Hill. Despite being a bad father, as well as seemingly void of morals and proudly offensive, there's no denying that he's just fun. We'll see who can't drive their grandson at night without glasses or a license using a mop to press the pedals. And although he's usually filled with hate, he does genuinely love Bobby, and he also killed Fitty Men. King of the Hill isn't the first show to have complex, human characters with flaws, and nor is it the last, but its ability to weave the struggles of emotional expression, family relationships, and pride with so much humor and compassion is what makes it one of the greatest animated shows of all time. But what do you think? What is the greatest lesson that King of the Hill taught you? Let us know in the comments section below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you get notifications whenever we upload. But most importantly, stay wicked.